All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. I'm Adam, I work for Penn State, uh, and I'm going to be talking about building a performant and accessible replacement for content DM using uh, That's me up there, email, Twitter, and Slack if you wanna reach out. So uh, very quickly, we're gonna talk a little bit about the vital statistics, how we're gonna be replacing content DM with this application we call Cho, then why we use Valkyrie, and then some specifics about how we're building it and what we've done so far. So the vital statistics, these are gonna be the what's, the why's, <coughs> who's, how's, and why's, et cetera. So CHO stands for Cultural Heritage Object, and then repository is in parentheses, which would make it core, which I actually like more, but for some reason we're just using CHO, so that's how we're referring to it. Uh, Nathan Tallman is our product owner, he's our uh, digital uh, preservation librarian at Penn State, and then there's myself, technical lead, Carolyn Cole, our, one of our developers, and uh, Mike Tribone, who's our UI designer. And then we have numerous stakeholders from the Penn State Library uh, community. So the big picture is we're exporting stuff from ContentDM. Uh, we're gonna do a bunch of remediation of metadata, probably using OpenRefine, so in a, in a CSV spreadsheet context. Then we re-import these collections into Cho using the CSV and bags for the binary content. There will be further metadata work inside Cho, adding new content, doing more cataloging work, that sort of thing. And then the bags will be exported out of Cho and put into a preservation system that has yet to be determined. So the schedule we started first, first sprint was October 25th of last year. Uh, and we were alternating between ScholarSphere, which is our other uh, institutional repository project, alternating between Cho and, and ScholarSphere, and we kind of took a little while to figure out the schedule, and now we've settled in on this uh, six-week, four-week thing. So we have two sprints, or sorry, two-week sprints, and ScholarSphere takes four weeks, so that's two sprints, and then we have Cho for six weeks, which is three two-week sprints. And at the end of each, and that's been going on since February, at the end of each one of these uh, six-week cycles that we call them, we call that an MVP mini-release. That stands for Minimum Viable, Viable Product. And we are, let's see, we've just, we're in the middle of MVP4. Uh, there's a total of seven that have been scheduled. There's probably gonna be some more uh, and that we hope to have the MVP finalized by next year sometime in the fall semester. And then have a first production release in 2020 somewhere. Kind of vagueish dates, but that's the, the general idea. So using Valkyrie, uh, in short, the metrics told us that we should. So last year I gave a talk about performance uh, problems with uh, Hyrax, and I used Valkyrie as a comparison. What, I, what we did was compare Valkyrie's different adapters, the Postgres adapter, the, post, the, sorry, the Fedora raw adapter, and then an active Fedora adapter and then compared that with Hi, uh, sorry, Hyrax 1.0. And uh, our, our situation is we have a large number of collections, uh, one in which that has over 385 plus uh, works in it, so we kind of use that as a benchmark. And we ran some, ran some tests. The upshot of all of that was that we discovered that there was a solar configuration issue that was causing some problems with performance, and then we fixed that uh, this was after the talk, so the, the talk, the result of the talk was there's a problem with the solar configuration. When you fix that, things are much better. So then I went back and ran the original test, which was uh, doing a total of 100,000 works inside a collection. This is no binary, no uh, metadata, just an empty, an empty work. And when we ran that with the different adapters, we found that Hyrax over here, which is the, sets a sort of a teal color, uh, really still has some problems. By the time you get to between 60 and 70,000 works, it's taking really long to create each new work. So this line right here represents about 60 hours of runtime for that particular test. Whereas Postgres, down here at the bottom, you can barely see this tiny little blue line. Uh, I think it took about seven minutes to run to do that same test, uh, 100,000 works inside one collection. So that pretty much told us conclusively that we really, if we wanted to have a good performance system, we were gonna to need to use something that could handle 300 some odd 
1,000 uh, works that Valkyrie was, was going to be the way to go. So at that point, we chose. Now, I have not done the test with Hyrax 2.0 or 2.1, I guess, is the current release. So I don't know how that has changed since then. We had to make the decision right then because um, we needed to start. And it was, it was going to be Valkyrie. So as we've moved forward, uh, what we've done is continue to run these uh, metrics. And show is still lagging a little behind. Um, the MVP3 release right here, you can see there's this red line uh, that represents how long it took to create 100,000 works inside this collection. Show took 43 minutes, uh, which is not great. It's not doing, you know, a big spike where it just keeps getting longer and longer. So we still have some work to do with that. I suspect it is network latency because our solar index, uh, solar server, and Trey's nodding his head. Uh, my, I suspect it's latency because solar's going off the network and you can see there's like a little spike here that probably could have been when the network had a blip. So there's still some work to be done, but it is still pretty performant, at least compared to our previous tests. So the opportunities that have arisen from choosing Valkyrie is we have some new stuff to learn, which is fun, I think. Functional Ruby, uh, Dry Ruby, which is one of the dependencies of Valkyrie, and Transactions, which come part of uh, Dry Ruby. Uh, we've taken an opportunity to kind of re-envision our entire code and practices. We've reorganized our, how we, uh, we've changed the way we've organized our repo. We don't, in terms of just the folder structure, uh, because we took this opportunity to say, well, if we're going to be using this new uh, system, this new practice uh, paradigm in Valkyrie, why don't we extend that out to other things? And it's been, uh, it's been very healthy, I think, because now we start to ask, ask ourselves questions about things that we assumed uh, before and have uh, come to some new, some new decisions, which we like. We've also had some collaborative sprints with Princeton where we worked on single-valued attributes and optimistic locking, which was uh, some great feature, new features to add to Valkyrie. And we are looking for more adopters. So if you're interested, come talk to us. We'd love to collaborate. So the challenges that have resulted from this choice are significant. Uh, Hyrax, for one, had a bunch of freebies. It had a UI, it had PCDM modeling, it had derivative generation, it had characterization, it had all these goodies. And we don't have any of that. We're going to have to build that ourselves inside Show. Uh, dynamic. Property definitions are a new thing that I'll be talking about where we dynamically assign properties to the different resources at runtime. And we're not really sure how that's going to play out. It's working good now, but we see that as possibly being a problem in the future. And then IIIF integration and the universal viewer, because we haven't done that yet. We want to do it. But the, uh, the ultimate bit is, an, I put this little statement down here after Carolyn said something, Carolyn Cole said something at the poster session that reminded me. We're choosing to confront problems that we know we can solve versus problems we do not know or cannot solve. For example, we know how to build a UI, we know how to do PCM modeling, we know how to do all this stuff that Hyrax gives us. And we kind of have some good ideas about the other ones, right? But the performance issues, we really didn't know how we were going to solve that. And frankly, we're not even sure we could. So that was essentially the ultimate reason why we ended up choosing, choosing Valkyrie. So now we talk about building Cho. So at its core, I think Cho is a, is a CSV API. Uh, now that I think about it, every component has a CSV interface. When you update collections and create them, uh, either collections or works, you can do this via a CSV import and an export. So if you have a collection with you know, a bunch of works in it, you can export it, it in a CSV format and then change all of those values inside the CSV, like its title and all of its metadata uh, properties, and then re-import that same CSV and it will update all the works inside the collection. And you can do this uh, for creating works with uh, bags as well. So there's a CSV with metadata and then a bag that has all of the binary content in it and you put those two things together and you upload them and you, then it will create the, uh, the works that go inside the collection. The collection has to be pre-existing uh, and you fill that out as a, you provide the collection ID as part of one of the fields in the CSV. Additionally, all of those properties, the dynamic properties that you can define on your works and collections are also controlled via CSV as well. I'll be explaining that a little bit in the next slide. Um, this includes defining a property's behavior. So a property like subject uh, or title, a subject could have a controlled vocabulary that could be specified 
uh, in this CSV as a field. You can define a, a controlled vocabulary. Uh, you can specify certain validations. Is it required? Uh, does it have to have a date format? That's those sorts of things. A transformation, such as taking, say, a date in a ISO 8601 format and transforming it to, like, you know, what's the Thursday, Thursday, October 11th, that sort of thing. Uh, and then, of course, default values can be specified in this uh, CSV file as well. So that's what has prompted what we call the data dictionary, which is everything, all of our properties defined in one place. And uh, this is a bit hard to read, I apologize, but essentially you have each field here in this column, and then you would have its field type, whether it's a string or a date, some kind of requirement de designation, such as it being uh, required or not, a new, uh, or another kind of requirement, such as required to publish. You could have fields that are required to save the record, but maybe other fields that are required if you eventually want to publish uh, this work to uh, a public public uh, place. So all of these values are seeded into Cho when it's first initialized, and then they are dynamically assigned to every resource. That could be a work or a collection. So even if it's a field that has nothing to do with a collection, it would be available on the resource. But then we have another kind of concept that we call schemas that selectively apply uh, those fields to either the collection or the work or its subtype. So you, we have various kinds of uh, work types for specific work, such as a document or an audio uh, file, uh, a map, those sorts of things. And those would have different metadata requirements. But yet, all of the fields are all available to every resource, but we use that schema to sort of filter them out. And the schema is itself also a Docker resource. So dynamic field definitions, this was kind of a new thing for us. Uh, everything's defined on resources, change sets, and solar documents. So in Valkyrie, you have the resource, which is akin to the active Fedora base object or an active record base object if you were just doing plain rails. Then we have this, uh, another uh, concept called a change set, which is similar to a form object. And then, of course, it, this is also a blacklight application. So there is the solar document in there, which is used to get the resource out of solar and display it in uh, the search results for, with blacklight. So all of those uh, objects in the application need to have these, these fields defined on them. So you have to b basically loop through every, that's what that little bit of code over there is for. You have your dynamic field array and then you essentially just loop through the array of every field and you define the property on it. This, this is what it looks like for a change set. So you define the property uh, its type, you know, if it's multiple or not, and then maybe you'll have some validations defined there. And those are all, those values are all coming from that data dictionary uh, table that I showed you. The schemas filter the fields for editing and display. So you have a work type that's a map. You'll have a map schema that says, you know, you have these kinds of metadata fields available to edit and display. It's all loaded at runtime. Uh, and eventually we want to be we want this to be changeable in a live application. And we don't know how we're going to do that yet. <laughs> um, that is a requirement from our stakeholders and product owner. Is that the librarian or administrator using Cho should be able to even create a new work type and say, here are the fields that we want to have available to this work type when you're creating it and editing it. Uh, and that's su supposedly going to happen in a live application. And I, we know we're going to face some problems with that, but again, we think those are going to be problems that we can, we can solve. And it's, of course, still a work in progress. Uh, we haven't implemented all of the different things with controlled vocabularies and requirement designations. We've just sort of identified them as those are the things that we want configurable. So the bags. This is how we get binary content into, into Cho. It's uploaded as a zip file and then validated it's a, the, validate the structure and integrity. So it's, it's a bag, so we can use the bagit library and, and calculate checksums on it. But we've also built a whole other set of custom code to validate the actual structure of the data, di the data folder inside the bag, and that's what you see down here. So this would be a, a bag that's an example of, say, a, uh, it's a two-page PDF. Right? Or it's a two-page manuscript, for example, that has, some, that has scans on every side and then also has a PDF that represents the whole thing. 
And this would be what is coming out of uh, content DM. Well, I should clarify, and I may be mis misspeaking here, but our preservation files are not in content DM directly. There are some, and you're shaking your head because you know, not, you can't put them there. Uh, we have some access files, and we're kind of, it's, this process will be handled outside of, of what we have to do. So this is what we're going to be getting. And this is what Nathan is going to be putting together. Uh, so you have multiple works. You have file sets. We had to create a file set object inside our application, similar to Hyrax. Uh, we're going to generate derivatives as needed, and then determine the file set use. So I apologize if this is hard to read, but you essentially have, there, here's a file set right here. We have a preservation file. That's the original scan. You have a preservation redacted TIFF, and this is so, as I understand it, Penn State needs to provide high res uh, TIFF files to the public, but of course some of this information needs to be redacted. So we have a, a special class called the Preservation Redacted TIFF that is a publicly accessible high resolution file, but with the sensitive information removed. Then there would be a service file, uh, so, that would, so that's like your, your first page breakfast. Right? Then on the verso, you have page, the back side of page two, you have another little file set. And then there's the second page with its front and back. And then you have a PDF representing the whole object with a extracted text for searching and a thumbnail. Some of this will be coming from show, some of it will not. If it's not provided by, or sorry, if some of this will be coming from content DM. Some of it will not be coming from content, content DM. And if it's not provided, we will generate it as needed. And then part of, along part and parcel with the bag is the CSV file, where you can provide the metadata. You give it a work identifier, which corresponds to this folder here inside the data directory. Then you have member of IDs, which is which collection it belongs to. It's batch ID, which is the name, essentially, of the bag. So that way, we can go find the zip file when we upload it to the server. A work type, document map, et cetera, and then I just put title up here, but really this could go on you know, all the way <laughs> all the way over here with however many fields you want to, to add to your work. And then the identifier for the file set is down there. And so we can put titles as well as any of, any of our metadata from the data dictionary onto our file sets. It can be defined on a file set. <coughs> so benchmarking. Uh, benchmarking is built directly into the code base. And we, because we started our whole process with deciding what we wanted to build, Hyrax versus uh, Valkyrie, we had all this benchmarking code in. So we put it in the application. Uh, and it simulates, we can use it to simulate collections of any size. We can now randomize metadata. In our previous test, we did not use any metadata. But now we can. We use the Faker gem, which uh, uses a bunch of YAML, uh, YAML files, I believe, to provide uh, like lorem ipsum text or like, you know, you can put anything in there. There's like Star Trek characters and planets if you want to use that sort of thing. Uh, then we can s uh, randomize binary files to simulate storage. We run them as rake tasks. And then the, the generate reports of, of individual creation times uh, for each work. That's how I generate all those pretty little graphs over there. Uh, and then um, the total time, essentially. That's what we generally use when we first, if we have an MVP release, we'll do like run it through time. Uh, run the rake test through time, and we can see, oh, well, it took us, you know, 40 odd minutes to do our test so that we know we're kind of keeping with our, our performance benchmark and we're not slowing down. Uh, let's see. The benefits here are, well, we can measure the performance after each MVP mini release. So we know kind of right away where, where things are, if things are going wrong uh, by identifying performance impacts early. We can hopefully avoid bad architecture or code decisions. So if we put in something and we see, hey, our, our it now takes like two hours to create our 100,000 work collection, maybe we should kind of go back and see what we did wrong, because obviously things are getting very slow. Creates a complete feedback loop from coding to release. Um, and this is so we can engage our DevOps people early. Because usually what happens is we say, you know, spin us up a QA server and we'll come back to you in like a year when we're ready for production release. And then at that point, you're looking at, well, what, what are all the things that are going wrong? So now we can hopefully identify those things early so that our DevOps are kind of with us with each little mini release. And a great example of this is when we released MVP2, all of a sudden we noticed like collections were taking forever to generate. It was taking li hours, literally hours. Uh, and it came down to there was this uh, IPv6, I misspelled that. 
uh, IPv6 firewall rule, and it was like packets were just getting, like it was just, the, it ended up being certain packets were getting sent over IPv6 and it was just waiting. So it was creating this big network lag. Uh, and we fixed the firewall issue and boom, everything was great again. So now we come to accessibility. Um, also very important to Cho's development process is keeping accessibility first. Uh, and this isn't our decision. Uh, it's really coming from Penn State. We have a policy that requires uh, all of our applications to be WCAG 2.0 AA compliant. Uh, that the WCAG is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, they're following 2.0, which I think came out last year, but now there's a 2.1, which came out in June, I believe. And so we're probably, yeah, there it is, approved in 2005, and 2.1 came out in June of this year, uh, which we're, which we're going to follow as well. Even though the policy says it's 2.0, it's going to be 2.1. So we're, that's what we're going to be aiming for. Uh, and inside that, com that, inside those guidelines, you have like single A, double A, and I believe there's a triple A level, and we're, we're shooting for, for double A compliance. So what that's translated to is that we've, we've decided not to use any JavaScript for now because we had a lot of problems finding uh, libraries and components in JavaScript that could meet this level of accessibility compliance. And instead we've decided that we're going we're gonna to maximize the client side HTML5 as much as possible because that does work really well with screen readers and you don't have to do anything uh, if you use HTML5 compliant tags. One example is the data list element. Uh, this would be a drop down for choosing something for, uh, say, a, from a control vocabulary. We found it really, really difficult to find one of these that worked in any of the different JavaScript libraries that was really accessibly uh, compliant. So we said, all right, well, let's use this data list element in HTML5, and it works, it works pretty well. And at the end of each MVP release, we ensure that we are still meeting these requirements. Unfortunately, that means a lot of manual testing. We use the Wave Accessibility Toolkit, which is a plugin with Google Chrome and Firefox that runs a report and kind of pops up a bunch of little, you know, signs on your page that says, oh, you know, this, this color contrast isn't, isn't enough, you know, it's too, too dim or something, and then, you know, these things are a problem and we have to go back and fix those. Uh, we ensure that everything is navigable by the keyboard, and then we also test it against screen readers with JAWS, JAWS and the uh, Mac OS voiceover. We have a uh, department department or a group within Penn State that will test our applications with us and meet with us and, and help us out. They've been tremendously uh, helpful in that regard uh, to make sure that we're meeting all of these standards. Unfortunately, it is not, uh, we haven't found a suitable automatic replacement for this. So we're looking for that if anyone's interested. That would be a, a great benefit because we wouldn't have to keep doing the manual tests at the end because sometimes we find find things at the very end and we have to go back and put in more tickets. It'd be nice if we knew you know, right away if we were putting in something that was causing a problem. So the other thing about Cho is there's actually no active record in this at all, uh, which was again part of, part of one of these decisions that we made uh, when we were kind of re-envisioning everything about how we were going to develop this, this product. Uh, Valkyrie res resources are used throughout. Uh, the only place that active record is involved is in dependent gems like devise. So there are migrations as part of devise, but we are not writing any active record migrations ourselves. It's just all uh, Valkyrie resources throughout. And the reason we decided this was basically for consistency. Uh, all resources now have the same interface. And why would we support multiple database abstractions in the same application? I mean, yes, we're doing active record for devise, but that's devise. You know, if devise has change, changes, we can pull those in and just run whatever requirements it has. But then we don't have to say in our application, oh, we're, we're looking at this, this object, then we have to remember, oh, that's an active record object. You know, and this other one's the Valkyrie resource. Everything's Valkyrie, just across the board. And that's, so far, that's worked out very well. We like that. Last, uh, this is something that Carolyn Cole refers to. She's our, one of our developers. She's our team lead. Uh, we call this walking the path. Um, and this, we kind of coined this as we were going through various uh, decision-making processes when it came to the, trying to decide what we were going to do when we were presented with an option for choosing a particular 
technology or particular strategy. So the idea is that when deciding on a code change, dependency, or technique, or practice, anything, uh, take each decision to its complete conclusion. That is, if you're going to implement, say, Valkyrie resources, do it everywhere, right? That's how we ev eventually arrived at the no active record decision, because we thought, well, if we're going to have to maintain two different types, that's more, that's more technical stuff you have to keep in your head, right? Uh, the, the kind of side effect of that is that sometimes things start to look worse before they can look better, because you kind of get in the middle of this and you're like, is this really a good idea? This feels really weird. Keep going. Walk the path, get to the end, get to the very end, the conclusion, and then take a step back and see what it looks like. And then decide, is that really worse, better, do we like it, et cetera. Um, and ultimately, not making a choice is itself a choice. And the example is that when we were looking at Webpacker, this is when we came to our uh, no JavaScript decision. So we, we took a lot of time actually to do this. We tested React, Angular, Elm, and Vue. We took each one, we installed, we installed it, we did, we took a, I think in React in one case we like built a, a chessboard game. You know, we, we, tried to, we tried to take it to its absolute conclusion by integrating it into our application and having it do something. Not just the simple, you know, hello world, right? We tried to see how, what this would look like if we were really trying to put into our application and, and ultimately we decided against it because of the accessibility issue because we were specifically looking for, in most cases we were looking for that data, that data drop down. You know, where you want to be able to, to choose something and move it into a, a column like you were, I, I want to choose this controlled vocabulary and um, move it into this, make this selection and that sort of, we had some complicated interfaces that we wanted to have that were accessible. And we kept looking for different uh, solutions within these different uh, JavaScript frameworks and ultimately we didn't find any that, that worked. So we decided, no, we're not gonna do it right now. Um, that doesn't mean JavaScript's not going to have a place. It will uh, at some point. We don't know. Probably not MVP. It'll probably be our first production release. And the, what we're going off right, right now is require accessible interfaces using standard HTML alone. Because that's kind of like our lowest common denominator. We know we can, we know we can at least aim for that. And then beyond that, probably look at something like progressive enhancement for adding uh, JavaScript later. Again, this may change. We don't know. But again, it, this is a problem we, we, we feel like we can solve. So that's why we went with that, going back to avoiding problems that we know we probably couldn't solve. So when did I start? Uh, you've got to be two minutes. Oh, wow, I didn't know I was going that slow. Okay, so there's questions. Yes, Colin. Hi, forgive or me. Calvin, sorry. Oh. Hi, forgive me, I didn't quite understand the real world context of your benchmarking at the beginning. I kept quiet. The very, the very, very beginning. The very, very beginning, yeah. The real world context was we needed to decide if we could do a large collection in Hyrax that would, similar to the ones that we knew we were going to have in this, in our application show that we were building. So we st I, I created a benchmarking process that just created a bunch of works inside a collection using Hyrax and using, and then using all of Valkyrie's different adapters to see how long it would take to see what sort of performance impacts there were. So was it, was it 100,000 you required them? Value? Yes, so we, we looked at, uh, and there's a link to, on that slide that there's a big long write-up that goes through all the different tests, because I tested both inverse related, so like works pointing to collections, and then collections that contain works, so like a one-to-many relation, and then I tested some binary files. So his question was, he didn't understand the real world uh, scenario of my tests. Well, the real world scenario was then, was in the, we, when we get to the end of our, we have Cho ready to go, and it's gonna be like, okay, we have to import a collection from ContentDM. We know it's gonna have 385,000 works that we have to put into that collection and let it go. Ultimately, we saw that Hyrax was taking 60 hours and it was only at like 70,000. Whereas Postgres with Valkyrie was, taking seven minutes, just to hit 100,000. So it was the initial import? Yes, the initial import, and then assuming that it took you know, that long to, to get to that point, what happens if you need to add you know, next work to your 385,000 collection? How would that happen? So. Other questions? 
Hi. Um, yes. We have actually done similar testing with Hyrex 2.1 uh, with uh, Fedora 4 at the back end, and we are trying to, because we have got our own different 22 types of work types. So you, you have how we, many different kinds of work types? We have 22 types. So uh, basically, it's nested and highly nested in yes. some cases. So we are trying to figure out through benchmarking what are the implications. And uh, we are trying to run the rake tests on a benchmarking server. So assuming that all the Fedora, Solar, and the actual application is running on the same server. So to a certain extent, we could get retrieve some of the you know, visualizations. But then um, there are certain things like you know, file uploads. It's not very realistic to run a rake task. And uh, you know, because there are network latencies from if, if, if a client is to upload from a different server. Mm -hmm. So what approach would you take? I don't know. That's a good question. And that speaks to her questions basically like how do you, you're going to have users that are interfacing with your system in a certain way that isn't reflective of your benchmarks, right? So how, what's the, what's the validity of your benchmarks in that, in that scenario? And it's a good question. Um, we would need to, we do some binary uploads and that, that would, that wouldn't test from user to server. It would test from the point the, the, the user is able to get their files up to the server. Like our benchmarks would reflect what happens after that. And is that performant? Uh, fortunately, in our case, Cho, a lot of the Cho imports are going to be done uh, over network storage. So there really won't be much direct GUI HTML file upload. So, but to, a lar to speak to the larger point about benchmarks, it's essentially having something's better than nothing. Uh, and then at least knowing if, you know, we know that it takes us uh, 43 minutes to create a 100,000 item collection. Okay, maybe that's not great, but if it takes four hours, two weeks from now, something very wrong happened, and we should go back and look at that. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Just one in the back, and then. So we're, we're out of time. Oh, we're out of time. Okay, uh, well, so I'll recommend that anyone just come questions and for Adam, we'll talk. maybe yeah. go talk to Adam, yeah. but we have to set up for the next presentation. Okay. So uh, thanks, Adam, for sure. the, for Thank the you. talk. Sure, oh.